We now welcome John Clifton, Managing Director, Gallup Global Analytics. Thank you both for those uh, <clears throat> introductions. Stuart, thank you for your leadership with Meridian. Gallup takes a great deal of pride in our partnership with Meridian. We're really excited to be here and launch this new report. You know, today's conference is about foreign policy. And considering it's about foreign policy, it might be fitting that we talk about the biggest issue that's facing the world today. According to Gallup, conducting surveys in over 160 countries and doing it for the past 10 years, we found that the single biggest issue facing the world today is jobs. What the whole world wants right now is to have a good job. But there's a problem with it because there's a problem with how it's measured. Take, for example, some of the other most significant issues facing the world today. According to the UN, roughly one billion people across the planet are hungry. Half of the people around the world live in poverty on less than $2 a day. Another major issue, literacy. There are a billion people around the planet that are illiterate. Another major issue is clean drinking water. Another billion people go every single day without access to clean drinking water. Now, what do the data say on jobs? If jobs is the single biggest issue, according to people interviewed in 160 countries, what is the jobs issue? Because unemployment right now, according to the ILO, in 2014 is 5.9%. Only 200 million people right now around the planet out of 5 billion adults are unemployed. Why is that? I think many of you are familiar with this magazine. <clears throat> Probably something that all of us read on a weekly basis. But I'm going to do just maybe a pop quiz. Because a lot of us think that the poorest countries in the world might be where the joblessness is. And the rich countries are where the good jobs are. So let's look at unemployment rates from around the world. Right now in a country like France, what is it? 10% of people are unemployed. So what percent of people are unemployed in a place like India? Of course, we know all of the challenges that face India. So would it surprise you that half as many people are unemployed in India, 5%? How about in China? What's the job market like in China right now? The data for China right now are slightly under 5%. Unemployment is lower, according to the official statistics, right here in The Economist, than the United States. Now, of course, there's a higher number of people, obviously, in China, so there are more unemployed as a raw number, but as a percentage, it's lower than America. Of the 44 largest economies on this list, what country has the lowest unemployment rate? It's Thailand. Now, if those data don't make sense, they shouldn't. Because if you look at the statistical relationship between unemployment and GDP per capita, one would think that they would be negatively correlated. The answer is that they actually have no correlation whatsoever. This is what the statistical relationship looks like. Now, you might ask yourself, why is that happening, John? There must be an answer to this. There is. And it goes with how it's calculated. The way that unemployment is calculated an oversimplification is the ILO makes a recommendation to central statistics offices all over the world and they say do a survey like this ask people did you work 30 or more hours in the past week and if so was it for an employer or was it for yourself people answer those questions and then every country reports their official statistics according to the Indian government based on this the last time they updated theirs was 2013 now Gallup replicates what the ILO recommends and this is what we come up with. In fact, our data are almost identical to what the ILO comes up with. We interview 140,000 people all over the world asking exactly the same employment series. So why is it that only 8%, if this is the largest issue in the world, are unemployed? The one thing is, is the real unemployed hide within one category, self-employment. You can see on the chart, 30% of people around the world are employed for themselves. In the West, when we hear self-employment, we think two things. 
entrepreneurship, and a small business owner. But for the rest of the world, it means begging or being a subsistence worker. Think if you were living in a place like Nepal and you were working on a farm, a subsistence farmer, and you were asked the question, did you work 30 or more hours in the past week? The answer is obvious. Of course you did. But did you have a real job and did you have a meaningful job? The answer is no. And we know that because when we look at the people that fit within the category of self-employment, almost half of them live on less than $2 a day. That category is putting in people who are begging. Now, you could argue that if you bundled half of the people that are self-employed and you bundled the people who are part-time who want full-time with true unemployment, your real rate would look more something like 34% of real unemployment as opposed to 8 or 5.9 according to the ILO. But there's a light at the end of the tunnel because if you look at the data on 41% full-time for an employer, that's a metric that we can look to for leadership to say move that needle and people's lives will get better. Why? Because when you look at the statistical relationship of that, it tracks almost perfectly with GDP per capita. If people get jobs for employers and you have strong uh, small businesses growing and hiring a number of people, that's what strong economies look like. Now we've captured that. We call it our metric, our good jobs metric. Um, and we've looked at this for uh, a number of places. But here's the math. If you use that and say that that metric, the 41%, is the barometer for good jobs, this is what the real math looks like for the world. We know that there are 7 billion people on the planet and there are 5 billion people that are adults. People that are actually looking for work, it's 3.2 billion people. That's who want a good job. So if we use that metric called P2P, employed for an employer, we could confidently estimate that about 1.3 billion people have a good job. But you know what that means? 1.9 don't. But the problem gets just a little bit worse. And here's why. You know, I had a conversation with a woman from the World Bank. She's an economist. And I told her, we didn't just want to create a metric for good jobs. We wanted to create a metric for great jobs. Because what if one day we held leaders accountable, not for how many people had no work whatsoever, but the percentage of people who had great work? She said, we're working on the same thing at the World Bank. And I said, well, what indicators are you using? She said two things. One is the amount that they're paid, and the other thing is their benefits. There's a huge problem with that. Gallup has been studying workplaces for almost three decades now. You know what people do in jobs where, that they hate? Regardless of their pay, they will take a pay cut to do something they love. Here's another big one. If you're in a job that you absolutely hate, or you hate your, ma hate your manager, you don't, you're not able to do the things uh, that play to your strengths, your well-being, how you see your life, is actually worse statistically than people who have no work whatsoever. But think about that behavioral metric. Because if we're solely focused on things like traditional economic indicators, like money, we don't pick up on how somebody's life is actually going. So that's why we tried something a little more subjective. And so in addition to looking at the good job metric, we said what people really want is a great job. So we asked a series of 12 questions, which we call engagement, to see how people are doing within their jobs. I'll give you three of them, because I know what a lot of you are thinking right now. John, this is too soft. I would never use this for policy. What do these questions actually look like? Here's one of them. I know what is expected of me at work. We've asked this in over 160 countries. Do you know that there are 50% of people around the world that when they show up, they can't say they strongly agree with that item? They don't know what they're supposed to do when they get to their offices around the world. The next one, how about having access to the materials and equipment you need to do your job effectively? Only 40% of people say they strongly agree to that around the world. And here's another one. At work, I have the opportunity to do what I do best every day. Only about a third of people around the world can confidently say yes to that item. So when you bundle that to the good jobs metric, ask those people this series of questions, we find that only 12% of people around the world have those great jobs. This is the real metric of the global joblessness situation. So if you do the math, 
As we said, we know 7 billion on the planet, 5 billion people are adults, and 3.2 billion people who want not a good job, but a great job. And if we follow the math, 1.3 people have a good job, but when you add that 12%, only 161 million people around the planet have what we would consider a great job. The rest don't. The report that you have at your tables today shows you the percentages by every single country in the world, not unlike the back of The Economist, to say this is the percentage of people in every country that have a great job. We're hoping that that's the new metric that leaders are held accountable to. Not this issue of unemployment where people who truly don't have jobs are hid under a category of self-employment, but this to get people with great jobs. This may not be perfect, but we're moving it into a direction so that leaders are better held, held account, accountable for the biggest issue facing the world today. Thank you.